Well, I'm absolutely loving this Rooted series and uh, something about uh, the journey that we've been on is each week it asks a different question. And this week is how does God view money? And I know many of you, you're investing your time, you're investing resource by doing different service projects uh, with, your, with your group, your Rooted group. And so there's lots of things that are happening with maybe you're serving a neighbor or serving within our community, joining in with another ministry that's going on. And so we just want to thank you for that because we don't want to just come to church. We want to be the church. And so those are exciting things. And when we see how does God view money, to answer that question, uh, we're going to look at his approach to that. And when you talk about money in church, uh, if you talk about money, people get funny. You know what I mean? It's like, I, like heart rates are climbing right now. People are like, I'm getting nervous. I'm getting nervous. Um, I absolutely love uh, the approach that um, our staff, our elders, our team um, kind of takes with it. And we just, it's not what God wants from us, it was, it's what God wants for us. And so we're going to be answering some different questions. Okay, what does God want for us and what, does, what is his approach when it comes to money? And it's important, you know, how we talk about it and how churches talk about money because some people can be hurt by the different approaches. There's some wrong ways uh, to talk about finances or to talk about money. One of them is like the guilt approach, like you have to do this and if you don't and the shame that can be involved and if, you know, it's just so much guilt, it's overwhelming and so we're compelled by the guilt. I can't believe that you haven't given or you you aren't being blessed because of this or whatever. You, you have a greed approach that can be communicated that somebody may say, hey, you know, I'm being from a standpoint of like, if you, your reason you're not getting blessed in your life is because you're not giving enough or we're giving so that we can get. And that's not the right approach. There's, there's a blessing that God may bring within the area of finance, but we don't give in order to get or, or to gain. Or we think, you know, if, if I give, then my kids are going to get good grades, you know? If, if I give, like, God's going to take the calories out of my cheesecake, you know, because I gave. And so that's not how it works. There's the greed approach. There's also approach of a, a, a God to you gotta, you gotta give. Like, if you don't, then this is gonna happen in this other country, or the church is gonna have to shut down if you don't give that. And sometimes churches handle their finances where it's kind of week to week, and then all of a sudden it's like, we have a problem, and then there's giving out of desperation. There's giving because there's a situation that's happened rather than giving out of determination. Like, hey, I'm determined to be obedient, not we're desperate, and so we're gonna call out and ask for money because of different situations that might go on. You know, even as a church, uh, you know, seeing a room of this size, I just want to tell you, um, often before we used to pay, pass an offering basket, and anytime we talked about money as a church, we would receive the offering earlier in the service. So it wasn't like, I'm going to preach on it, so we have good money, good offerings come in today. Um, we actually don't pass a basket any longer because there were like 80% of the church gives online. And so you're like passing the basket, and you're like, I give online, that's I, I give online, you know, and it just, so we just want to remove the confusion. If somebody, maybe you're here for the first time and you're coming in and you're like, oh, I came to this church and now I am hearing about money. I think you'll appreciate the approach when we look at scripture and the way that we approach it, even as a church, but it can't be a got to, like I got to give, you know, we utilize a next step box where it's part of our next step. It's part of an obedience that we have. It's joining God in his work that he's doing. And, and God has an approach. So we're going to look at scripture. What does God have to say about money? What did Jesus say when it came to finances? What did Jesus say when it came to generosity? And, and one of the ways that, that God communicates through scripture is there's a priority to our giving. There's a priority to our giving. And so the priority is this. We would give first, we'd save second, and we'd live on the rest. We'd give first, save second, live on the rest. That's how God views money. There's a priority in the way that he would desire for us. We take those steps. Often, we kind of live first, and then we have some leftover that maybe we can save or maybe we can donate to something. The reality is, is there's not that much left over. See, even as a kid, I learned at a young age on how to give. When I was nine years old, I started driving a tractor. I'm not talking like a lawn tractor, like a... You know what I'm talking about? Like, did that describe it very well? Because I thought it was probably one of the worst impressions I've ever made of a tractor, to be honest with you, but thanks for nodding. Um, but I would drive this tractor. My dad put me on it just to probably, one, get me out of the house. 
Um, but then two, he needed some help. And I remember I worked and I drove this tractor and I got a check for $27. And so giving 10% of that was really simple because I was nine and it was three bucks. I still had 24. It's amazing, you know? And that was rounding up because you know what my dad taught? You always round up, son. And so I would round up. It would only be $2.70, but not with my dad. You know, it was like, you need to give that full tithe plus round up. Let God worry about the rest, right? I'm like, okay, dad, that's just what I learned at a young age. That was different than getting $2,700 or getting $27,000 or $270,000, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, it, was, it's, it was at a small amount, trusting him with a small amount. And so I just kind of took it for granted and I'm like, didn't think a lot about it. That Even now I have to really think because it'll be more of a habit for me now, which is a good habit. But what about a prayerful habit, one of expectancy, one that's not just limited to a certain percentage, one that reflects a gracious and heart of gratitude? Even with our kids, we, we wanted to do an allowance for them. We call it compensation because an allowance is expected. Compensation is earned. And so if you do these things, then you get this blessing. And so we put it in three categories, give, save, and live. Give is 10%. Save is is. 40% and live is 50%. And that's how it operates. And the live, they can spend that on cotton candy and sunflower seeds and, you know, getting their brows done and their fingernails done and whatever, it, you know, it's progressed over the years. Um, or, and then the save is like they have to get approval to use the save account. And that's for a car or things like that. And so that's how we do it. And how we do it is they get $2 per month per, times the number of years that they've been alive. Okay, so if they're 15, they get $30 a month. That's a lot of money. And it goes up by like two bucks every time they have a birthday. So every time they have a birthday, I'm like, well, they get presents and I'm out two more bucks. Um, this adds up to a lot, total of $182 a month because I have a lot of kids. Okay, <laughs> that's my problem. Okay, annually $2,184. Okay. That's a lot, but hopefully they're learning the principle of how to handle money. We haven't yet seen it happen, but we're believing that it's going to happen, okay? We're believing that God can do a miracle. But it's learning at a young age or at an older age, and maybe for some of you, this has never been a practice of give first, save second, live on the rest. God has a priority in his approach. He also has power in his approach because he says, this is in Acts 20, it's more blessed to give than receive. It's more blessed for you to give than it is to receive. See, being rooted means we're going to be followers of Jesus. So we're going to do what Jesus did. We're going to do what Jesus taught. And when you look at the first followers of Jesus, after Jesus came, died on the cross, rose from the dead, they're carrying out the teachings of Jesus. They were in these small groups that gathered together, these small house churches. Their faith put them in a position that they could lose their life for following Jesus. So they really clung together. They were living in what we would call a third world country now. That's how they lived in those days and times. So they were very impoverished. They didn't have everything. But at the same time, they were extremely generous, extremely generous to the point that many gave all to see churches planted throughout that area because they had started a church. They were providing for one another. They would send out these pastors from those places to go plant other churches around. Extremely generous. First off, they loved one another as family and they sacrificed for one another. They loved one another as family and they sacrificed for one another because often when people would begin to follow Jesus, their family would disown them. So they became family for one another. They made a sacrifice too because they knew Jesus. They wanted others to know Jesus. So money was just a way that they were able to spread that message of Jesus to other people. They're like, hey, we know, how do we give this message to other people? And so they allowed the finances and resource to flow through them. They also learned to put money in its rightful place, to not let money be on the throne, to let Jesus be on the throne. Here's one of the challenges we have. Money is more powerful than we think. It really is. Like for some of you, we ended that last song, announcements went, you guys clapped for announcements. That's awesome. You're excited about announcements. You guys are like, oh, announcements. You know, like, yeah. Oh, money talk. Oh, my heart rate was at a 62. <laughs> 114. You know, you're like, 
our heart rate begins to climb. We get a little bit stressed. There are people that they've left churches because of how money was communicated or not communicated, used or not used. Like it can become a divisive situation. And sadly, some churches and some pastors or ministries or people, they talk or they teach about money from the wrong approach. There's a wrong way of talking about it. We have to say, okay, what did God say about it? How did Christ instruct us on how to handle our finances? But realize that money is more powerful than we think. But also money is less powerful than we think. Here's why. You realize that gold has an extreme value in our time. You know gold in heaven is God's gravel. It is. Because the streets are paved with it. It's like God's asphalt. You know, it's not that big a deal. It's everywhere. Okay? What is it here? It's a big thing. It's something that we cherish. We look for. We're like, hey, I want, I would like more of that. I'll collect here. See, you're worth more than what you would consider your money. You're worth more than what you make. You're worth more than the company that you own, the way that you lead. For God gave his only son for you. So we need to take money off that throne and put God in his rightful place. He cares more about you and the direction of your heart than how much money you have or how much you give. He cares about your heart. And if we're going to be rooted, right, followers of Jesus, follow Jesus. Followers of Jesus, follow Jesus. So guess what? Our money should follow Jesus if he's leading us. Our marriages should follow Jesus. Our singleness should follow Jesus. Jesus. Our language should follow Jesus. The way we treat people should follow Jesus. Our schedule should follow Jesus. So it's not just a money thing, it's a heart thing. It's the way that we live should follow him. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You either hate one or love one. For if money's on the throne, God can't be there. But guess what the world tells us? Spend it now, you can make it up later. Right? Debt. You know the average American lives on 105% of their income. It's only 5%, right? Well, that's big bucks over time. The average American has $14,000 in credit card debt. That's a weight, and some of you are under that weight, and you're like, man, this is difficult, but we had to, and here's why. There's things that can happen, but debt ultimately becomes our owner. Lust becomes our Lord, where we want things. Have you ever been tempted? I was tempted this week. (laughs) Oh, daddy, was I tempted. (laughs) Those are my love language. Some people ask a service, physical touch. No. I can serve God with AirPods. I can be hands-free to do whatever it is the Lord would lay upon my heart. You know what I mean? Like, I can listen to a podcast. I can listen to the Bible. I have a conversation with someone. Tell them about Jesus. Like, I need them. Like, all those are all the voices that came to my head when I'm like, $249, and just to think how I could serve God. That's very inexpensive. You know, it's amazing how we can start to justify things. Have you ever been targeted, marketed? You know what I'm talking about? Like where something is advertised, and you're like, have they been listening to my conversations? Yes, they have. You search something on a computer and it shows up on your social media feed. You're like, what has happened? (laughs) Your kids search something and you're like, all of a sudden, like, well, it looks like they're looking at Jordan 1s. You know, it's it's, it's funny. We have a a staff member. He'll remain anonymous. But Chris Easley and I were talking this week. (laughs) And he's like in the room and he's like, dude, seriously, your phone can hear. And I'm like, really? Really? He's like, yeah, I'm like, 
<laughs> no kidding. Um, he's like, watch this, Wendy's, 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 Siri, Wendy's, Siri, Wendy's, you know. He's like, did you get an ad for it? I'm like, no, but it was cool to hear you do that. Um, <laughs> but it can hear, right? And you know, we love generous people, right? I love having generous people as my friends. How many of you guys uh, have a friend that has alligator arms? Let me explain. Thank you for dining with us. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. I got this. Just gotta reach the check. (laughs) Almost there. I can't reach it. If you have alligator arms, you avoid picking up the check. What? That's what you do. I got this. Thanks, Dennis. If you want to save 15% or more on car insurance, you switch to Geico. It's what you do. Oh, that is good crispy duck. (laughs) Uh, Generosity, right? We don't like splitting the check with that person that you know you're going to get hosed. You know, like I had a friend in college that was like, hey, dude, let's just go have these. And I'm like, it's never have these with you. First off, you ate half my fries. Like legit, dude would eat half my fries and then want to go have these. And it's like, do you tip like negative 4%? Like you're horrible at math. You don't know how taxes work, but somehow I paid $15 and you paid eight, you know? But to be generous, to really have it flow out of you, to say, I'm willing to share. But to know that there's this battle that goes on that you're being marketed to, And then there's also this battle to be stepping out in faith, to be generous to other people. But then the way that God views money, and he gives us instruction and direction to be generous and to be giving and to give back what is rightfully his by giving to a local church. These are all concepts that are quite challenging. In Psalm 145, it says, you open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. See, Proverbs 11 talks about there's one who gives freely yet grows all the richer and another who withholds what they should give and they suffer want. The open hand or the closed hand. Just right where you're seated, would you close a fist? Close your hand. Real tight, like almost cutting the circulation off kind of thing, right? If you've got that closed hand, what does this say to you? It says mine. It says I've got this. It says I'm in control. It says there might be a stronghold. I'm trying to to keep something for myself. It's not saying I trust. It's saying I trust myself. I've, I've got this. Or you want to try to take this out, you might be in a fight, right? This closed fist. There's no blood flow. But then open that same hand. The blood begins to flow freely through that hand. An open hand, look down. It says, I need help. An open hand says, I'm willing. An open hand says, I trust. An open hand says, let the resource pass through my hands. An open says, surrender. There's a difference between I've got this to I trust him. What if we prayed and said, God, my hands are open for you to freely bring your blessing in that I get to bless out. I'm a conduit for you. You're the catalyst. I'm a conduit for your work in the lives of others. See, there was a church of Corinth, and they struggled in the area of generosity. They struggled in a few areas, but generosity was one of them. John Link talked about it last week, and he was talking about this early church, and there was a difference between a sheep and a goat. And the sheep, they were compassionate, and they took on the posture of our Savior. But the goats, they look similar, but they're different. To be compassionate. See, that church in Corinth, they were doing church. But they made promises that they were going to give financially, and they weren't giving. So Paul had to not just write one letter. He wrote a total of four letters. And he spent four specific chapters addressing the fact that they made a promise that they weren't keeping. So we had to write them and say, hey, be generous. In fact, why don't you be generous like the church in Philippi? See, there was a church in Philippi that was very impoverished. This church, chapter 8, verse 2, 
For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. They overflowed in generosity. They gave not just according to their means, but above and beyond their means by choice. They gave in obedience, but then they also gave another level of generosity because we can't claim generosity if we're doing a base level of giving. Generosity is over and above. Well, this was one of the poorest churches. In fact, the poorest churches in Scripture were the most generous churches. Those are the same trends that we have now in our day and our time. Often, those who have the least give the most. You ever been on a missions experience? You ever been to another country? You ever walked into a feeding center? You ever been to a family that's sharing a small portion of food and you watch the generosity that takes place? Having the least but yet giving the most. And Paul's writing this letter and saying, I'm going to come visit. Please be prepared to be generous. He had to give them a warning because he knew if he confronted them when he got there, they weren't going to be ready because it wasn't an overflow of their heart. And in chapter 9, verse 5, it says, I thought it necessary to urge you brothers to go on ahead to arrange in advance this gift that I've promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, gift not as an exaction. That's basically like donating a kidney versus getting one wrangled out of you. That's a different thing. To say, hey, I want to give of something that I have versus whoosh, surgery coming in to get it. Because there's a need. To not give out of exaction, but rather willingly give. Verse number six, the point's this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. That we should give generously. To sow generously into the lives of other people. To give generously. If you're asking yourself, what is generosity then? What does it mean to be generous? If there's somebody that's in need... What if you put your, if you're going, okay, I want to be generous to them. What does generosity look like? Put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in their shoes and what would be generous to you? What would generosity look like? And then be generous in that manner. Next, don't just give generously, give willingly. See, when we give willingly, each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Not reluctantly or under compulsion to give willingly. See, at 7.15 every Sunday, we gather in the like pottery sculpture room just over this way with lots of awesome creations all around us. We take time to pray, and the prayer almost every week, and specifically this week, is that we'd have willing hearts. Our hearts would be open to God, that we'd have willing hands. God, our hands would be open to allow your resource to pass through us. Our feet would be quick, ready to meet needs that we see in the lobby, wherever it goes on, God, however you would use us. Our minds are open to hear of your word and be challenged in our thinking. Our hearts are open to be changed, a willingness to give willingly, to live willingly. What does it mean to give willingly when you're in a marriage and you have different levels of what you would consider generous? Because in almost every marriage, there's a spender and a saver. That person that is not controlling, but that person that's saying, hey, I want to honor God with this, and and I'm keeping because we need to prepare, and I want to be ready, doesn't mean that they have a bad heart. And the person that's like, let's just give it away, I'm not really worried about it, doesn't mean like, oh, they're the right one. There's a balance between the two. But a conversation is important, rather than guilt being thrown on one or judgment being thrown on the other, to have a conversation and saying, hey, guess what? I may have this gift of generosity and I may be willing to just, hey, we're just gonna trust God, but I may be causing my spouse to stumble and I may be giving willingly, but they're giving begrudgingly because there isn't a conversation, there's just judgment and I don't know. But then also at the same time, what if God is testing you and saying, would you just trust me? Would you step out in faith? Is there a meet in the middle? Is there a conversation? How can you both give and it be a willing heart, not begrudging or reluctant or under compulsion or with exaction, but decided in your heart so that it can be an offering that's given, a peaceful gift? That's what it's talking about here, a conversation that can be had. What does it look like to have a willing heart? What does it look like to have a joyful heart, to give joyfully? 
that each one would not just give reluctantly or under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver that we would give joyfully. When you give joyfully, it means you can find joy in knowing that God's going to use it or look at what God has done. Or some of you, when you step out in faith, it's like that laughter, like nervous laughter, like, ah, I hope it all works out because this is a big, st- ah, praise the Lord. Ah. Sorry, that was awkward. Um, but I just couldn't stop. I did it like three times. I kept going. Um, but it's that nervousness of we're stepping out in faith. Sometimes it's a laughter of like, I literally can't believe that God worked that miracle. I cannot believe he let us be part of that. How do you think the first people that invested in Rock Harbor Church that we're gathering on a Sunday night feel right now to know like we stepped out in faith and we did not know what God was ultimately going to do? We don't worship them. We worship the God that planted them, the God that called them out. To see those steps of faithfulness, to give in a joyful way, one of like trusting, one of pleasure, one of sharing and encouragement with other people about God's faithfulness. You know a question that people ask a lot, if I give, is God going to take care of me and meet my basic needs? I'm gonna step out in faith and it's uncertain, is God gonna meet my needs? Yeah, keep reading verse number eight. What does verse number eight says? That all, that God, look at all the alls that are listed here. There's four of them and then there's an every. So if you have your program, you have your Bible, you wanna circle, underline it, these are imperative to read. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. All, 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 and every. If we give and we trust him, he gives us the greatest gift. You know what the greatest gift is? It's not money. The greatest gift is grace. He gives us abounding grace. You think of Solomon in the Old Testament. Was given, what would you like? He chose wisdom, and wisdom gave him everything. Grace gives us life itself. Grace, undeserved favor that we do not deserve as sinners. That's better than money. That's something money can't buy. But the death of our Savior on a cross bought us that grace, and we're given abounding grace. So if you give, will God meet your needs? Yes. He will bless you above and beyond. What does your giving do? It blesses you. It blesses others. And when you give with other people, there's with much thanksgiving that takes place because you see it happen and multiply. That's why you look and any project you've been part of, some of you that are currently serving right now, you give and you come alongside one another. We do giving tree that takes place and what you may not be able to meet the needs of an entire family for Christmas, but we all come together. We all do our part and look what we're able to be part of. Even as a church, you see what happens and how we can, how can we support an orphanage in another country? How do we have a feeding center where we feed 150 kids every single day? Because we all do a part. We're all in it together. And what used to be that first offering that was gathered on those Sunday nights, that first month, we had $20,000 that was given and we gave away 10%. The first 10% went out. Why? Because we didn't want to say, hey, we should all tithe. No, as a church, we should tithe. As a church, we should set aside a part so that we can plant churches, we could build feeding centers, plant orphanages, churches in this city, partner with Boise Rescue Mission, partner with Meridian Food Bank, Chrysalis House, lots of ministry going on in the city. We're planting churches in this city. We're not just trying to build our church. We're trying to plant other churches and nationally planting other churches and globally planting and seeing ministry go and take place. That first month, $2,000 was set aside. Guess what? Last month, Rock Harbor, $25,000, more than tenfold. This year, yeah, $300,000 this year invested in church planting, feeding those in need, meeting ministry, making it happen. We get to do that together. And seven and a half years ago, when our church started, I did a little bit of math on the churches that didn't exist back then, but exist now. Last year, churches that were not in existence, but Rock Harbor Church has either fully funded them or planted them in our city, in our nation, and globally. That means seven and a half years ago, zero people were attending. Guess what? 
You count all those church plants and the multiplication of your finances, your resources, the coaching our team does, the working and partnering with it. 11,600 people were in church last weekend because of your generosity. Yeah, 11,600 people. That's what we get to do together. So how do we join in his work? Well, we have to make a commitment. We have to commit that I will give God my first and my best. I'm going to give God my first and my best. I'm not going to give God my leftovers. It's give, save, live. Rather than live and then let's leftover God. Leftover saving. No, we give, save, live. So I'm going to give God my first and I'm going to give God my best. Jesus said it this way in Luke 6.38, Give and it will be given to you. Do you hear that? Give and it's going to be given to you. Give first. And then the receiving comes later. Good measure, pressed down. This is the blessing that comes to us when we give. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it, it's going to be measured back to you. See, in this day and time, when Jesus communicated this, this was an agrarian uh, society. of Agriculture was how most people were paid. Most people earned a living. Most people survived. So you'd have these masters, these people that were landowners, they would bring in day laborers for the time of harvest. And what would these day laborers do? They'd go around, they'd collect, gather up the seed. They'd gather up the grain, they'd gather up the harvest. And they'd carry around these baskets. They, they had these bushel baskets that they would walk around and, and pick up. And, and, and just let me explain this to you. When they would pick it up and they're doing their work, they'd fill it about half to three quarters full, right? Because they could handle it. I mean, these are big, heavy baskets. They come and they dump it out. But how do you think? Because if, if their master was a generous person, sometimes they'd get to the end of the day or the end of the week and they would say, go ahead and fill up that basket and take it home with you for that's your pay. How do you think they filled up that basket? You know, one when you're working, half full, you'll get more. I think this is how they did it. It was kind of like a little hammer move, like a little MC hammer, dump it out, then go get some more. When they go to fill it up to take it home, you better believe they'd be shimmy shaking that thing. Like, get it all the way down, fill it all the way up. It'd be flowing over, running into their pockets, down in their boots. They're like, that's fine, we're taking it all home. That's how they did it. That was the blessing that God gave. Maybe some of you can relate to this. How do you fill up your icy? right? You fill it up, you know, you're slurpy, you fill it up, and then you go like this. You knock it down. You made me take a few pulls off it. You know, you get a little, you're slurping on the slurpy. How many of you guys have done this? Be honest, you're in church, okay? You do that. You knock it down, you get that lid, that lid goes up, that gets you even more, you know, and you're like, oh, you know, I got to taste it. You got to sample it. Some of you won't admit, like, be honest. Some of you are like, oh, it's totally organic, okay? It's fine, okay? Maybe that's not you. Maybe, maybe some of you can relate to Mongolian. Oh. I'm a ninja. You didn't know that. Okay, you can relate to Mongolian. You go get the Khan. Not talking about the mighty Khan, you get the Khan. And what do you do? Well, I'll tell you what you do. You press it down, running over, put it in your lap, just like the Bible says. You press it down, running over, till it falls in your lap. Let me show you a picture of what that looks like. Right here. <laughs> That's my son. I raised my kids right. Son, you want more on top of the bowl than you actually have in the bowl. That's how we do it. You know why? Because we're cheap. Why in the world would you pay $11.49? $11.49 when you can get by with $8.49, right? Why not put as much as you can? It would fit in here. Makes sense. Guess why? We'd rather do more laundry poured over into our laps than pay three more dollars. That's how we raise our kids. But that's the blessing. Do you understand? That's the blessing that God wants to give you. He's not saying bring the bushels in and it's overflowing going like, hey God, here's the money. No, he's saying bring into the storehouse. What I put in your care and just bring it back. And when you bring it back, guess how I'm going to bless you? Overflowing out into your lap. That's your blessing. That's not your requirement. That's your blessing that he wants to bring to each one of us. But you know what we end up doing? We limit God to money. And we think we give money, so we're going to get money. 
it's going to be a dollar for dollar exchange. So you may say, Keith, if I give to God financially, will I be blessed financially? Let me be very clear what the Bible says. Yes. It is very clear in Scripture, if you give financially, he will meet your needs. Now, I want to also be very clear. It's not, I give financially, and I'm going to be blessed financially over and above. It's going to be exponential. I'm not making a promise. I'm not giving you a prosperity gospel. The reason you're not getting is because you're not giving more. But it's very clear that there is a financial blessing in trusting in God because you're putting the ball in his court. You're saying, hey, I'm trusting you with my first and my best. But I'll tell you this. You will be blessed with a peace and a joy that your money could never buy. You want to talk about the greatest blessing? It's not just the finance. That meets a need. That's temporary. It's going to pass in a vapor. But the eternal life, the joy that comes in surrender, the peace that's going, dude, God, not God, dude, capital D. Um, <laughs> God, the ball is in your court, for I trust you. I trust you. So I have a peace. This financial situation, I've been faithful, and I trust your faithfulness. Not blaming God, God, this is your problem but faith that he is and will provide more than enough. And he brings a spiritual, an emotional, a physical peace that money could never buy. But this isn't about money. You know what Rudy tells us? This is about faith. See, giving recognizes our dependence on God. Deuteronomy 14.23 says, The Israelites were to give one-tenth of all their crops in order, that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. To learn to revere the Lord your God. To fear and in reverence and in trust the Lord our God always. It shows that we understand it's God who provides. We tangibly express our faith by saying, God, I believe you will continue to provide for me. It keeps our focus on the giver as opposed to the gift. Capital G, giver. The giver, the one who gave everything in his only son rather than the amount that we're giving. There are different types of giving. The first is tithing. There's much discussion these days about the topic of tithing, if, not if we should tithe, but how much we should tithe. Well, we can take our cue from the definition of the word tithe. It means a tenth part. This is found in the Old Testament. The Bible tells us there are many ways to give offerings to God, to honor him by bringing our best to help others, the church, poor, widows, and the orphans. In the Bible, the tithe was never supposed to be all that's given to God, but rather a starting point. It was instituted to help God's people begin to learn how to give and to become channels of blessing. I realize you can read this, but when I read it, it made me think about things differently. See, I grew up, at, like I said, at that young age, just out of habit giving. I don't often, sadly, I don't pray as much as I should about the gift that I'm giving. I don't pray often, God, do you want to test me in this? Are you asking me to increase what I'm giving? No, I'm doing what I'm, and I'm going to manage the rest, God. It's all his. It gives us some direction. It says, one place that suffers when we, when we don't trust God to meet our financial needs is giving. Consider a tithe challenge. Increase your current tithing level by 1%. If you tithe 5% right now, the challenge is to trust God with one more percent and begin tithing 6%. If you haven't stepped into tithing practice at all, then begin with 1%. Trust God to continue to meet your needs even though you have taken 1% and given it to his church. If you're already at 10%, then move past that by a percentage. Wow. The hardest challenge isn't in giving isn't moving from a certain percentage to another. It's moving from nothing to something. Put it to the test. See if your trust in God, see, see if your trust in God with this extra percentage leads you to a hardship or leads you to a reward or, and a blessing. Take this tithe challenge and watch God work. It also talks about free will offerings and how we give above and beyond like many of you that are giving above and beyond your tithing and building a building a couple of miles from here. 
And we're watching that be a hub and a place for our community uh, to gather, not just on a weekend, but all throughout the week. It's over and above. It's trusting God, and it's all of us, hundreds and hundreds of families taking a step to trust him in those ways. And when it comes to this tithe, think about it like this. We don't give our tithe to the Lord. We return it. It's his. We don't give it. We just return it. And we say, I trust you. For I'd rather live on 90% that's blessed by God than 100% that's in my hands. 90% blessed, 100% in my hands. It's not what he wants from us. It's what he wants for us. And what are we supposed to do with this tithe? Malachi 3.10 says, bring this tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. The Old Testament storehouse was the temple. The New Testament storehouse is the local church. For God loves his church. Jesus Christ died for his church. On this rock, he'll build his church. And I have a pastor friend that was sharing with me that he was having a conversation with a guy, and he said, well, I'm not going to be giving as much as I used to give. And he was like, why is that? What's going on? He goes, well, my son is going to a Christian college right now, and he's preparing for ministry. And so instead of giving to my local church, I'm supporting a Christian institution with his tuition. And so I'm going to do that until the college debt is paid off. And that is my effort to give to God. We think, that doesn't make any sense. But you know what? We do that stuff all the time. We say things like, oh, I'm not going to give in this because I'm helping in this, or I want to help this friend, or I want to help, this is my giving, and we do this, and we control, rather than letting God control and trusting him. Why would we bring it into the storehouse? Well, it goes on to say, thereby, therefore, um, thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no need for more. A blessing awaits us. And this is less of a conversation about giving and finances and more of a conversation about faith and trust. Who do you trust? Would you bow your heads with me? It's incredibly challenging as we dive into God's approach. It's so gracious, it's loving, it's freedom that awaits us. It's open-handedness, it's watching him bless He wants to bring more blessing. He wants good things for his kids. He wants to take us along for this ride of faith. And some of you are hearing this, and there are probably people in different positions here. Some would say, man, I've been faithful, I'm obedient in that, and I'm being tested by God to continue to trust and maybe take a step of faith. For some, you've walked away from tithing, you've walked away from giving, Maybe some things have come upon you, but today is a day to step in and say, you know what? I surrender in this area. I want to trust God fully in the area of my finances. I want to be obedient. And for others, maybe rooted is new to you and this conversation of what it means to be a follower. And it could be challenging to go, okay, giving and where my finances are. But maybe your step today is a smaller step. Maybe it's to step in and say, I want to give 1%. I want to obey God in this. Maybe it's 5%, maybe it's 10. Hey, I'm going to take this big step and I'm just going to trust him. Maybe your step's a conversation with your spouse to make sure that this is a willing and joyful gift that's being given, a generous one being given. But we each have a step to take today. Do you trust him? God, we praise you for the work that you've done in our heart today. We praise you that We can see your blessing all around us. And God, you've given us a gift that money could never buy. God, if money is on the throne of our life, God, I pray it would be removed today. We would feel your conviction in this area. We'd also feel your hope that comes when we know we get to be part of something we could never imagine. We'd also feel the community around us and watch the multiplication of trust in this area and see you do an incredible work. Let us continue to be faithful and bring encouragement to those today that have been challenged. They've been called up into this area of obedience. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen.